I'm very thankful for the life given and the keeper of life, Kodamawa Haile Selassie first. We glorify him in all doings and say, all power and might of such the Holy Trinity. And he himself, we give thanks continually for his presence in our doings and sayings. We're very thankful also for such a Congress that has been established under a worthy founding leader, our President, our God and King, the Honorable King Emmanuel Charles Edwards. We're thankful for Marcus Messiah Garvey you know, his presence within the whirlwind, within the earthquake, within the thunderstorm, the black tiger himself, the night thereof. Honorable Priest Isaac, here with you, giving you another one of our video lecture presentations. And this is a presentation entitled Semenkare, He Who Is Often forgotten and many times in the past we have mentioned at least we have hinted of this individual Semenkare and who he is and the mystics of him in relation to Tutankhamun and this is what we want to highlight today now what we're going to do we're going to bring the story to life by going through a few of the paragraphs in the first chapter of the book entitled Act of God by Graham Phillips. The true story of the greatest cataclysm to shape civilization and the beginning, the first chapter, chapter one, is entitled Imprisoned for Eternity. And I read, In the early days of 1907, the wealthy American lawyer and amateur Egyptologist Theodore Davis was leading an archaeological expedition in Egypt's Valley of the Kings just across the Nile from the ancient capital of Thebes. His team included his cousin Emma Andrews, who acted as his personal assistant, the painter Joseph Lyndon Smith, who was there to visually document any new discoveries, painter, you know. okay. and the professional archaeologist Edward Arton, on the 11th of January, Arten was busy at the northern end of the valley, organizing a team of local workers to clear away a mass of debris that had been strewn around the tomb of Ramesses IX by excavators a few years before. About nine meters to the south of the tomb's entrance, where the rock face was almost vertical, the workers unexpectedly discovered a deep infill trench that had been cut into the hillside centuries ago. Arten initially assumed that they had uncovered a ceremonial gully, which originally formed a part of Ramesses' tomb. However, when they began to unearth pieces of broken pottery, predating Ramesses' 3,000-year-old tomb, it quickly became apparent that the trench must be a part of a second and older excavation an undiscovered tomb. So they went into and they obviously began to, to, to dig in to the tomb. I'm skipping a few paragraphs here as you know this is somewhat lengthy it says here according to Wigal, next morning he and davis arrived this next this next morning is now the 19th of january furious to find arton staring into a dark gaping hole anger soon gave way to astonishment when they saw 
what laid behind the wall. This was certainly no ordinary tool. From precious experience, an access corridor should lie directly beyond the bricked up entrance. Yet there was a second wall set in mortar and covered with an incredible hard cement. This time there was a seal. The plaster bore an oval impression depicting nine bound captives over which squatted a jackal, the god Anubis, the eternal protector of the dead, a device common to the tools of the 14th century BC. An unprecedented double barrier, the three forgot their differences and began talking excitedly there must be some religious significance to the second wall, some aspect of Egyptian funerary belief that no one had previously encountered. It was surely the tomb of someone very special. But who? The jackal seal should have been accompanied by a second seal bearing the name of the pharaoh. Yet... Yet, there was none. I repeat myself. Yet, there was none. Excited by what they had found, Davis was now impatient to enter the tomb. And even Wigal no longer objected. Some of the Egyptian workmen, however, became agitated, like, hey, wait, that's right, crazy man, the spells. Those who had worked on other excavations in the Valley of the Kings knew that there was something strange about this too. Some voiced concern over unfounded rumors of deadly booby traps, concealed pits or crushing stone blocks, while others were afraid of dangers of a lesser earthly kind. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Okay, let us see it from here. What, what transpired is certainly an episode of some of, uh, of, 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 of some of the strangest, pardon me, behavior of professional archaeologists in the annals of Egyptology. Instead of a methodical sifting through the rubble between the two walls, followed by a careful dismantling of the inner wall stone by stone that should be expected from leading experts in their field, the three ordered the second wall to be demolished <laughs> with the kind of amateurish uh, pickaxing that only ever happens in the movies, I'm telling you. Today, the rushed entrance into this mysterious tomb is considered the sloppiest. Wow. Today, today, in a man, the rushed entrance into this mysterious tomb is considered the sloppiest, most incom incompetent excavation ever undertaken in the Valley of the Kings. Hmm. Say so then, as the dust settled for the first time in over 3,000 years, the light penetrated the dark passageway beyond. Okay, I'm going to skip a little of all of that poetry. Uh, bam, good, Ramesses did this and that. Bam. Okay, let us hear this. Below small glazed earthenware vessels, decorated amulets, more panels and numerous fragments of broken clay were strewn hazardly across the floor. Mm -hmm. From the damage of the musty smell that hung in the air, it was clear that water had sometime flooded the chamber. 
looking up, Davis could see the cause. A long, thin crack running down the length of the ceiling had allowed rainwater, which occasionally um, scored down the valley in, in rare but violent torrents, to seep into the tomb and wreak havoc. Fortunately, not everything was damaged. Davis was relieved to discover that on the opposite side of the chamber there was a deep recess about one and a half meters square well above what had once been the water line upon which stood four undisturbed jars of polished white cal cal calcite with beautifully wrought stoppers in the shape of human heads, canopic jars made to contain the removed internal organs of the mummified body. Okay, as we gal joined them and their eyes became accustomed to the gloom, they could make out the coffin itself lying on the floor, lying on the floor, just below the recess, the wooden lion head barrier on which it had once stood, had long ago collapsed, bringing it crashing to the ground, jerking off the lid and leaving the decayed money, mummy exposed to the air. Having climbed down the wall and skirted around the rubble, the three men stood examining the coffin. It quickly became apparent that there was indeed something very peculiar about this tomb. The unusual gold portrait mask on the coffin lid made in the image of the deceased had most of the face ripped away. All that remained was the right eye. Wide and staring, examining the mass more closely, they could make out on the forehead the broken remains of the bronze serpent, the Egyptian symbol of royalty. The mummy was also, the mummy was not merely an aristocrat, it was a king or queen. But who? An inspection of the in, an inspection of the inscriptions on the coffin reveal even greater mystery. The name of the occupant in its cartouche, uh, the, the oval designs that surround the hieroglyphs in a royal name. You know what the, the cartouche is, um, I think the proper term is the, the shen had been scratched off. So the names in the Shen, in the cartouche, the name of the king or the queen has been scratched out. And in the same way, as, as was said earlier up in the chapter, after the, the nine supposedly, as they refer to them as prisoners, which in an esoteric way they are, under Anubis, and after should follow the name of the occupant that was, that was snuffed out said way. And we see the same thing returning here again. On the mummy itself, the inscribed gold bands that were wrapped around the dressings also had the name of the mummy deliberately cut out. Follow them vibes here. So this specific mummy that has been found here in 255, we're here in 1907. Tut Ankerman's tomb has not been discovered as yet. In fact, these individuals that have, um, these burglars here, that have broken to the tomb here, tomb 55, they thought that they had discovered the tomb of Tut Ankerman because an item was found maybe a year prior to this in the very same region with the name of Tutankhamun inscribed upon it. In fact, Tutankhamun's tomb is just 13, one three meters away from tomb 55, 
that we are in here at the moment. Mm -hmm. So as I said, even the, the gold wraps, the gold bands that were around the mummy, the names that were in the gold bands were actually taken out, deliberately cut, cut out, turned into the canopic jars and partly discovered that here too, the name of the mummy had been removed and inscribed panels on the belly of the jar had been chiseled away. At first they considered that the damage of the mask had been caused by the barrier collapse, but there was no sign of the missing item anywhere in the chamber. Certainly. The obliteration of the name Cartouche could not have been accidental. There was only one conclusion. Someone had deliberately torn off the face and serpent from the mask and purposely erased the name of the mummy as other priceless gold trappings in on the coffin had been left behind and the entrance had been intact. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. This selective, this selective destruction could not have been the work of tomb robbers. I'm reading from the book, The Act of God written by Graham Phillips, speaking of the, 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 the discovery of tomb 55. They would neither have left such gold work behind, nor resealed the tomb when they left. Okay. As the tomb seal was contemporary with the tomb's contents, the vandalism must have occurred during or shortly after the mummy's internment. Moreover, as it was an official seal of the period, it was an official seal of the period. The stripping of all evidence of the mummy's name, rank, and, and, and features must have been officially sanctioned. Hmm. This is a mystery now. Some real Scooby-Doo business here for real. Okay. Says they're looking around, they soon realized that the mummy had also been denied of the lavish burial goods that should surround the last resting place of an Egyptian monarch. No weapons or chariots for the occupant to use in the afterlife. No remains of, of clothes to be worn or food to be eaten, no statues of, of gods for guidance and protection, no jewels or wealth of any kind, nothing but a few simple amulets, earthenware boxes and jars with its name already etched out. I just added that part there. <laughs> Even the wall reliefs to show scenes from the occupant's life and depict his safe passage to the underworld were completely absent, merely cold, white plastered walls pitted and stained with age. Wow. Good poetry. The only sizable artifact in the tomb beside the coffin and the, the, the bear was the remains of a gold a number of gilded pad remains of a number of gilded wooden shrine panels found dispersed in various locations. The shrine which was intended to surround the coffin had not been broken apart and scattered by water. It had obviously never been set in place. Okay. All right. Not only had two of its panels been found high up the tunnel near the entrance to the tomb where they could not have been carried by water 
but the shrine itself was incomplete. You get what they're saying there? So the 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 panels then um, that 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 should make up the 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 wooden gilded shrine itself, the panels, they were like all over the place. S several of them were actually up, up, way coming up into the tunnel close to the entrance of the tomb, as if they were just whoever went in there just ripped the whole shrine apart and broke this up and threw this over here and threw that over there and didn't care and they just walked away and ripped the mask off and took time to chisel out the name of this person that is his, that is in this tomb that is what the author is saying that is really what people you know that's the consensus but while we're going through this let me mention now this is a good time for us to mention not that what they're saying here not that their assumption could be is wrong it could be right but listen to me now for sure their assumptions and many things as it relates to our history is wrong as well i think i've made it clear when i went through the whole science of akhenaten and tutankhamun for we are led to believe that that we we had a big problem with akhenaten and him and the whole concept of monotheism and the one god concept well i did a, an episode on the internet directly dealing with that subject area and akhenaten himself as it relates to tutankhamun and and tutankhamun and his very very unique presence with us which is something we will be getting into in a few moments and Akhenaten also was the, the the individual to usher in that very special presence with us so so what is seen by the outside world as some sort of change was a continuum basically something that was continuing from one stage to another stage, the living image of a man, you understand. So in the same way, there's a science that we deal with. His name and Tutankhamun's name is not on the, the king's list of Seti. There's a science that we deal with, the, the broken beads in the chain of Tutankhamun. There is a science that we deal with. So yes, this mommy now, and as I said, what I just ran through there a moment ago, I'm going to take a little more time in a few moments to explain it better. But for those who already know the, about that, it's the same with this mummy now, or it could be. For this mummy is seen with no name. Whoever this is, it's obviously someone important. This is the thing. It ain't no anybody, anybody. It's someone. It's actually a king or a queen. What you talking about? Yet still the coffin on the floor. Yeah, some water dripping there a few centuries ago. And, you know, yeah. But no, that wasn't enough to, to lift this up and throw it on the floor. Then the panel is all over. No, no, no. The water didn't do that neither. So what's going on here? And where is his name? Or oh, where is her name? I mean, everything is etched out, scratched out, cut out, carefully removed. And the place is intact. Two walls, two sealed walls. And why leave the ghoul wrapped around him? You know, what's going on? Where are his chariots and, and, and you know, the things that are supposed to accompany him into the afterlife? Just a few amulets, a little few things. And where's, where's the, the story of his life that should be on the wall and all of that? We, we are not seeing nothing like that as it relates to this mommy, this queen or king that is here in this, in this tomb. Not in the coffin, in the tomb because the whole shrine is being destroyed. Yeah. Okay. What kind of tomb was this? In ancient belief, if someone's name was wiped out of memory, now you see all of this is them people's opinion here, straight up. So also was their influence in this world from the afterlife. 
a number of Egyptian pharaohs were known to have exercised, uh, um, pardon me, to have excised the names of their dead enemies from their inscription. Okay, bam, 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 bam. I'm going to skip over some of them beliefs and assumptions there. Uh -huh. mm, right. Okay, so basically, yes, you know where we are there. I think I could take a good leap. Obviously, they have some concern about exactly who they found. Now, what I could tell you is that, again, the tomb of Tutankhamun was not discovered as yet. The tomb of, the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered basically in uh, 1922, it was, somewhere thereabouts. So that's like about 15 years after the, the discovery of this tomb here. So, okay, for example, here it says 15 years after, 15 years later, the own, and, and only 13 meters from the entrance, now listen to that, and only 13 meters from the entrance of the mysterious tomb discovered by Artin, Tutankhamun's tomb was again discovered, this time by Carter himself. This tomb was filled with the myriad um, celebrated burial goods and magnificent wall paintings, paintings, pardon me, which made it abundantly clear that it was the real tomb of Tutankhamun, who then lay in the tomb that Artin had discovered. Oh, sorry. Who then laid in the tomb that Artin had discovered? A tomb that was secured with Tutankhamun's personal seal. Now, you see, here we go again. Now, that 13 meter from the entrance. So, if you walk out of this tomb, tomb 55, and you walk 13 meters. Now, that's mystic. You just walk straight into the tomb of Tutankhamun. Now, now meditate on that. Hold that thought as we continue to furnish this discussion that we are having here. So, we see now that the tomb of this individual is sealed with the seal, the personal seal of Tutankhamun. And on the magic bricks you had the name of Akhenaten and on the panel you had the name of Queen Tai. So there was this confusion as, so who is this person then? Which one of them is he? Is, is in the tomb. In 1907, even before Tutankhamun's tomb had been discovered, Davis concluded that the mysterious mummy could, could not be the now famous king, as it was clear that, clearly, that of a woman. A woman? Yes, a woman. When they first unwrapped the ancient bandages, the first thing they observed was the position of the arm. See this. The mummy had been embalmed in the pose normally associated with queens of that period. What is this pose? With one arm folded across the chest and the other arm by the side. Instead of both being folded across the chest like a king. Now, What does that sound like? That's the when the bubble shanty woman pray. One arm across the chest and the other arm to the side. You understand? So it continues to say the mummy also, the mummy also wore a queen's crown, huh? as evidenced by the first published report of the mummy made by Walter Tyndale, an observer at the unwrapping. Like everyone else, he took the body to be a female. Her dried up face, sunken cheeks, and thin, leathery looking lips, exposing a few teeth, were in ghastly contrast to the golden diadem which encircled her head and the gold necklace that partially hid her shrunken throat. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, is that so? Beside the fact that the mommy's arms were in the attitude of a woman and around its head was a gold band bearing the image of the vulture. The same headdress shown frequently, pardon me, in contemporary portraits of queens and princesses. Both the coffer and on the coffin and the figure on the carved stopper of the canopy jar were depicted with the hairstyle affected by court ladies in the period. Arten, however, emphatically rejected all evidence that the mummy was a queen and not a king. It seemed to everyone that his obsession to outdo Howard Carter and to be the first to discover Tutankhamun's tomb was completely clouding his judgment. All right. What Tutankhamun's entrance scene had evidenced, however, was that the body had been entombed sometime during Tutankhamun's reign. I want, we, I want us to really follow this. Approximately between 1347 and 1338 BC, as Tutankhamun's queen was known to have outlived him, Davis decided that the mummy was Amenhotep III's wife, Queen Tai, who he believed had died during Tutankhamun's reign. As the stopper heads of the canopy jar was usually made in the image of the person whose organs they contain, Davis drew attention to their similarity to the statues of the queen. However, a stone toilet vase found in the tomb was actually inscribed with her name, as were other tiny amulets found in two small boxes. What clinched the argument for Davis, however, were the gilded panels forming part of a shrine that was meant to be erected around the coffin. They were de decorated in relief with figures of Queen Tai and an accompanying inscription declaring that it had been specifically made for her. Okay. So now everything here according to this aspect here of the book is showing and this is basically just carrying you through what the archaeologists, the Egyptologists of that time were considering and and exactly um, what they thought was, you know, before them. All right, let me just skip a few paragraphs because we'll stay on that forever. Within a few months, both Wigal and Davis were apparently proved wrong. In July 1907, the mummy was sent for a complete analysis to Sir Grat Graft. Con Elliot Smith, professor of anatomy at the Cairo School of Medicine. He found to his intense surprise that instead of the body of an old woman that Davis had led him to expect, he had been sent the remains of a young man who had apparently died in his early 20s. Other eminent experts were called in and all agreed that it was unquestionably the body of a young maid and definitely not that of an older woman. Not only was the mummy not Queen Tiny, but neither could it be Akhenaten, as he was known to have reigned for at least 17 years and had been well over 30 when he according to this book died and that's another thing because this same mummy in question that we are speaking of right now is considered by some scientists to be a Kenetan. just like pluto is no longer a planet this mummy that we are speaking of now 
that this author is showing you according to according to the the um, uh, the, re the research that was done in that time was not only the mummy not only an old woman it was a young man it could not have been Akhenaten, but of course, you know, science improves and they have some new dust that they can sprinkle on the bones and tell you exactly what they were eating for, for breakfast exactly on their 33rd birthday. So now they say that it's Akhenaten. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let us just continue here as we look to at least seal up the reading, at least for this part. Okay. Although there are no surprising records specifically referring to a brother, let me get this straight, of Tutanka Aman, a shadowy figure emerges from Egyptian history just prior to Tutankhamun's reign, who may have been just that. During the last years of Akhenaten's reign, a few carved portraits of the royal entourage, including someone identified as Ankh-Keperuri, bearing the appellation of uh, Nefru Neferu Aten. Fear is the beautiful god Aten. Aten. As this was a title used by Akhenaten's queen Nefertiti. The appellation would suggest that Ankh Kefru Re was related to her. As she had no sons, then he was probably a nephew and possibly Tutankhamun's brother. Ankh Kefru, uh, Kefru Re appeared to have dropped Nefertiti's title at the end of Akhenaten's reign in favor of his birth name, Samenkare. He whom the spirit of Re has ennobled. And as Ankh Keperu Re Samenkare, his name appears on a number of stones, finger rings, and furniture trappings found on the site of Akhenaten's royal palace at As Am Amara in Middle Kemet, Egypt. Samenkare, as he is generally called for convenience, appears to have become Akhenaten's chosen successor as a carved limestone portrait of the two of them side by side and both wearing the royal serpent was found on the site of the great temple at Amara in 1933. It also seems certain that he succeeded Akhenaten as a seed in the tomb of, of Mere the overseer of Akhenaten's harem at, Ama, uh, at Amana shows him in, in the position of a reigning pharaoh with his name enclosed in a royal cartouche. No records of his reign have yet been discovered at this time, at this time that we were reading here, although it does not seem to have been a long one. An inscription on a honey jar, honey jar duct discovered at Amana shows that Tutankhamun's reign began in the same year that Akhenaten's ended, and a wine jar ducket also found at the site dated to the first year of Tutankhamun's reign is inscribed with the words wine from the estate of Semenkare deceased. Okay. Now, what is very mystic about all of this is that when we follow in science today, for one reason or the other, this discovery 
is something not spoken of too much about and they, they definitely try to suppress it in one form or the other plus as well not only just trying to suppress it but now even trying to change the reality of this discovery to make it something else because there's something outstanding about this discovery here there's something that this brings out to light that maybe somebody doesn't really want you to know about so it is tomb 55 and tomb 55 is basically the very opposite of the tool of Tutankhamun. The tool of Tutankhamun is filled with gold and other precious metals and, and well established as the tomb of a great king. No other no other findings of a comedic king can compare to that which was found with the remains of Tutankhamun. That's a fact. And the chariots and the wagons and the armaments and the weapons and everything thereof was found with Tutankhamun. It was totally the opposite as it relates to Semenkare. Semenkare was found with nothing. Now, how mystic it is that Semenkare's tool is 13 meters, and we know we are dealing with beyond masonry now. This is the stuff that drops off of the tree that the masons try to catch and act as if 33 and 32 degrees is good enough. No, this is the ancient science. This is where it's stolen from. This science of understanding the metric system. This science of understanding um, um, trigonometry, algebra, calculus, and anything you can throw. So 13 meters away, you walk out of the tomb of Tutankhamun, you 13 meters, you walk straight into the tomb of Semenkare. So obviously there's this direct link here already, if you understand. So here we have Tutankhamun now, Semenkare. According to what we understand, this individual that they found, they found him like underground. He was not, not like Tutankhamun for sure. Tutankhamun was well set in, in the three golden coffers as such. The three golden caskets where he was inside the third one, that's Tutankhamun. But this individual now, Semenkare, was found on the ground. His mask was ripped off where only one of his eyes was exposed. His, his, his right eye was exposed. They were looking for the remains of the mask on the floor to see if they could stick it together and maybe see who exactly it was. The face on the canopy jars were also etched out. The face on the canopy jars usually resemble the face of the individual according to the author there. Hmm. And then now even the, the, uh, the gilded panel for the shrines scattered all over, scattered in positions that no water could have come in there enough to rise it to that position. No, that's not it. Somebody purposely left it there. And the place was left intact with the seal of the God to ank a man. 13 meters away from his tomb. A walk away, up his step, down the step at a I'm Semenkare into the gloomy nothing dead and on the ground identity taken away his name scratched off of everything 
his his wrappings that he has on his names are supposed his names are supposed to be on the wrappings and his names are taken out same thing with the so-called cartouche the shen name gone the names on the canopy jars with the organs gone the name after anubis and the nine so-called prisoners the nine souls gone no name yet still we find other people's name inside the tomb that's not even the person in the tomb akenatan's name was on the magic bricks but it ain't akenatan although they're trying to say that today but queen tyre's name was on the vase and 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 on the arm on the the panel but it wasn't her, although they were trying to say that yesterday. And Tutankhamun seal and other things claiming the name of the king Tutankhamun was found amongst this mummy. But it wasn't Tutankhamun neither, for sure. It wasn't Nefertiti, it wasn't none of these. It was Samenkare. But yet still his name is not in the tomb amongst the key parts where his name should be. Okay. So when they came to this conclusion now, because and rightly so, and, and rightly so, and I'm going to show you today why I I although you know I love Akeneta for more reasons than you could even imagine, but the point is we put everything in its right perspective. In the mystic world, this really proves to be the tomb of of Semenkari. Why? Now, Samenkare, this individual was in his 20s, young 20s, somewhere thereabouts. Remember, this is basically the same age, time frame, that it appears as if Tutankhamun was, was uh, died as well, 19.7 years, 7,200 days. Hmm. Okay. And Samenkare, the character, ruled basically for a very short time. Maybe like maybe weeks, maybe it was a day or two. Still not too sure. But he ruled after Akhenaten and just before Same uh, Tutankhamun. And his name is seen in the lists. Samenkare. So whereas Akhenaten's name is missing and Tutankhamun's name is missing from the lists of the kings, Samenkare is there. <laughs> now can you imagine that? So what is outstanding now? Samenkare. There are statues of him where he's seen with breasts. And people now are trying to say that that is a statue of Hachetsu. But you could look and see it's a man with breasts, nothing to worry about. Because the God Happy is seen with breasts as well. You know, and that concept, even Moses in the Bible asking the Almighty when he was getting a bit frustrated with the children of Israel is that, you know, you know what I mean? Did he bear these children? Is he supposed to, you know what I mean, give them suck on his paps? You know, in, in a sense, you know, no, not that he had no paps really. But you may disagree, but Moses is a is a typified God figure. Like Noah is a God figure, creational figure. You understand? That's why when you, you read some of these different translations, and you get it from the ancient language, you see, okay, this is what it means. So feeding on paps, even the Lord feeds Israel on his paps doesn't mean like you're really, not paps alone, but the breast itself doesn't mean that you are female or you're a woman or it's just symbolic in the same way of Akhenaten that you are fully rounded, you know. You are well connected with both masculine and feminine principles. And it's being expressed in a hieroglyphic way. 
it's being expressed in an allegorical way you know it's it being expressed in a in a, a mythical way as such a symbolic way so you see the king Akhenaten with his hips you know it is said that he has frolic disease because of you know his his long neck and his womanly sort of pose and all of that only to find other statues of him that has him looking like a regular human being this is Akhenaten you know but true Akhenaten is a god figure a god figure he's considered as the first Christ that's Akhenaten you know and the father of monotheism and all of that kind of stuff that's Akhenaten himself. So the same thing with Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun on his golden mask. Tutankhamun on his golden mask has the, the, the beast thing at the back of the mask. At the back of the mask, he has the beast thing. Now, the beast thing, the male bees don't sting. It's the female bees that sting. So again, it's another level of symbolism as you notice that the mask of Tutankhamun has the rays like the golden rays of the sun also depict, depicting pardon me the whole the whole golden rays of the of the bee the bee itself has the striped rays the gold and the black rays similar to what is seen on the mask of Tutankhamun as well for the bee is a very angelic animal so I'm just showing you how, how the kings could relate to things of the feminine nature in their expression. Doesn't mean nothing else beside that. In their expression, where we now can see the, 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 the positive and negative polarity, the male and female polarity. That is why on the footstool of Tutankhamun, the throne that goes with that footstool on the throne, you see Tutankhamun and his wife. And they both have on a pair of slippers or a pair of sandals to Tutankhamun and his wife. She has on one and he has on the other. She has on um, uh, uh, one, one of the pair, you know, it's one pair. It's not two pairs of sandals. It's one pair. And the wife has on one on one foot and Tutankhamun has on the other on the other foot meaning that they this this is this is not because they couldn't affair a pair uh afford another pair of sandals but it is a symbolic gesture to show you that the both of them are one that's it the both of them are one is the same thing with the statue of nefertiti with the one eye and the statue of akhenaten with the one eye and when you notice it is the opposite eye in each case showing you again that they are one they have the same vision they see the same thing it doesn't mean that any of them were one-eyed as again as i said it doesn't mean that tutankhamun and his wife couldn't afford another pair of sandals it is showing you that they are one male and female one so again happy is a male figure but seen with breasts is, is a science to show the god energy of happy to um, um not tutankhamun but akhenaten as a god figure as well is depicted many times in a somewhat feminine nature you know because he's well in tune he, he has tapped into that feminine aspect it's a real thing you know a real god is in tune with his feminine aspect whether you like it or not or think it sounds funny that is up to you i know exactly what i'm talking about and the same thing with with Tutankhamun again in other ways too but i just highlighted the beast thing at, at, that he carries as well as now Samenkare, seen with the breasts. That's that's the point I was making there. And other comedic characters, you see them like that, you know. So and again from biblical scriptures too, you get that hint that is carried there. So this Samenkare is a serious person, but why was he left in that way? Why is his tomb? you know in in so you know so different to that of tutankhamun what crime did he commit because it's sealed with the seal of the king what crime did he commit to deserve 
such a barrier. Now, what is also mystic here is in Tutankhamun's burial chamber. Tutankhamun is also wrapped in gold and he has his weapons on him and necklace and enough different things wrapped literally with him to ank a man and he has on his mask he's given his beautiful mask with his face on it now to ank a man is put inside of three coffin like three chests and each of these coffin chests also has well, let us just say his face on it. So follow me good. You have Tutankhamun. He, you wrap his body up and you put on his mask. And then you put him in a coffin that is shaped like him and has his face. Specifically, the young boy face. And then you close that coffin. Click. And then you take that and you put that in another one that has a face on it. This is the second coffin or the middle one or the middle coffin. And then you, you, you close that casket there, click, click, click. And that also has a face on it. That also has a face on it. That also has a face on it. Before I get to the face on that, we take that now and we put that in the last casket or the last coffin and we close that one, click, click, click. Everything is gold here, click, 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 click. And that has the face of Tutankhamun now in, well, not an elder state, but as old as he got. Because the first casket that he was placed in showed him as a young boy, like nine years old or so when he became king and then the last the third casket or coffer shows him at at about 20 years old when he was taken out or when he passed on according to the history of our understanding from the records that were discovered you know so so you have him at his his more his most elder state and you had him at the age a young age basically when he became king in the first coffer casket and the third coffin or casket or, or coffin, whatever you refer to it as. Good. So the second one now. The second one should, I guess, be somewhere in the middle of nine years old and 19 years old. Now, when you examine the second coffin, the second casket that took Anchorman's goodie, his remains were placed in, that second cof uh, coffin is not Tutankhamun. It's not a question of it doesn't look like Tutankhamun. Man, it is not Tutankhamun. It is somebody else. And there's no need to, you know, run around, you know. We can just cut to the chase as we say. That is Samenkare. And when you observe the other statues of him, you could see it is the Semenkare. Now, basically, the book, The Act of God, that we were reading from there highlights all of this. Uh, but the question is now, what's going on here? Now, this is obviously something that is overlooked by many. You, you wouldn't really hear no one talking about that. And even if a person may disagree, I can tell you for sure, I don't think anyone would disagree that that person in the second coffin or the face on the second coffin is not the face of the person on the first and the third coffin. The person on the first and the third coffin is the same person that is seen on the mask that is worn by the person that is wrapped up. I would totally agree with you. But that second coffin is somebody else. That second coffin is someone else 
that cement curry. And whoever it is, let us hold on here. Hold on. I want you to be with me good, you know. Tut Anchor Man in my book is not a regular character. Tut Anchor Man represents one of these divine spirits that are, are long awaited. When I say long awaited, like we've been waiting for 2,000 years for him. And after him, we're going to be waiting for about the next 2,000 years for another one like him. And then after that, maybe the next 2,000 years for another one like him. Tutank Aman, to me, represents one of those type of characters. We may not understand his purpose in history. We may not see what he has done that is more outstanding than anyone else in comedic history. In fact, we will, quick to, we, will, we will quickly put the Ramesses and the Setis at the top of the line because of, of you know, the, the, the general, the general, field martial general expression across the earth and across the kingdoms that were close by to that of Kemet at the time. I could understand all of that. But because I like to delve into the unseen and the metaphysics, we are speaking of all hail the feathered snake. I'm talking of Tutankhamun. We are speaking of all hail the cycle of the sun. The throne at the age of nine, 7,200 days, di directly connected with Lord Pakal, who also came to the throne at the age of nine. The feathered snake, the cycle of the sun, the 11 year sunspot cycle in a human being. That is Tutankhamun. That is he. The footstool says much, much more. That is he. The footstool reveals the mask of Lord Pakal with the Almec and the man with the beard and the locks and the man with the beard and no locks. That is he, Tutankhamun. Don't take him for a joke. Eh? Ask. Howard Carter, ask Lord Carnivan. The lights went out in Egypt when he died by the bite of the mosquito that bit him when he came out of the tomb of Tutankhamun. Lord Carnivan, now we can go on and on how his, how his dog howled at his death and the snake ate the bird when they discovered the tomb of the, the feathered snake, the flying serpent. His snake ate, a snake ate his bird. Carnivan, the man that sponsored the discovery of Tutankhamun. So Scooby, Scooby, do where are you? All of that stuff you see them portraying the cartoons, yeah, and the mummy coming out of the tomb, running you down, and the curse of the mummy, and all of that. Didn't you hear me say in the book that we just read, the act of God? That the Egyptian workers were like afraid to go into the tomb. Like, no, we ain't going in there. You okay? We ain't going in there. Mm. To give you five hundred dollars more. Oh, let's go. Come on, brother. Pick up the axe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the point is that they understand that something mystic. Not just booby traps. There be no booby traps. There be spirit traps, brother. The unseen world. The unseen world. And, and as it relates to Carnivan and those that were playing around with the tomb of Tutankhamun, we can go on and on and on and on. And we've done programs on that. We have done lectures on that that can be seen on the internet, that can be seen on YouTube. I could directly direct you directly to an episode we did on the YouTube dealing with the so-called curse of Tutankhamun. It's right there. Just check it out. And that will give you a good understanding of exactly what befell many of them that discovered the tomb of the most illustrious Kemetic king that we know, the feathered snake. He wore the bird and the snake. It's outstanding. And Akhenaten, you know, brought, brought him to the wilderness of Amana just so that he could come into the world. But the world don't see that. The world following the Egyptologists. And this said that, and that said that, and Finla Petri said that, and 
Brother said that and this other fella says that and some of us even run and say that too. No. Akhenaten is a god and respected as a god. Nobody hated him. Oh, they destroyed this and they scratched out his name. You see the same same hole, same hole again. Nobody can deny what I'm saying. Akhenaten himself took the capital from Thebes, brought it to Amana, Tel El Amana, created the city of Akhenaten, and created the concept of the Aten, the one God concept as the world now sees it as. The Aten was seen as the sun with the arms stretching out and touching, touching, touching Akhenaten and his family. I want you to follow me. Good. Touching Akhenaten and his family. And the Aten was the sun, looked like Ra. But you see, the only thing is that Ra had the snake uh, running across while, while the Aten had the snake looking straight towards you. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. But they both represented the sun. The sun, the cycle of the sun, the halo, the sun again. One thing, the sun. Because all the committed God in the Amun age and the Kepra age and the, 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 the Kunu age and all of that, they all rolled with the sun. You comprehend? So according to Egyptology, a funded so-called science, we are to believe that Akhenaten came and, and, and flipped the script and changed everything and did away with the Amun statues and did away with this, that, and the third and, and, and Kepra and Anubis and he didn't want none of that. Just give him the ball in the, fire, in the, in the, the ball of fire in the sky in the sun. In fact, he don't want a regular rap. He going to twist it a bit and give it some arms and turn the snake another way. And he created Aten. <laughs> that is what Aken Aten did. And he grew up in the in the family of the Amen Hotep. His name was Amen Hotep. You know, he was a Amen, an Amon. But he dropped all of that and picked up the Aten. That's how serious he was. And he changed the city and went somewhere else and created a whole new vibes. And gave birth to the feathered snake. And gave birth to the cycle of the sun. And gave birth to Tut Ankh Aten, the living image of Aten. And then after nurturing, nurturing the Tut Ankh Aten, he came off of the sea. And Tut Ankh Aten became Tut Ankh Amun, the living image of Amun. And according to how we read the history, reinstated the Amun worship. Of course, because Amun himself is here. The living image of Amun. Tut Ankh Amun and Akhenaten was brought to, to bring Tut Ankh, almost like a, a forerunner, to bring forth Tut Ankh Amun in his, in his royal position as the feathered snake. That was a holy tag team there, but that the whole world missing now talking about Seti. Um, Seti King Seti left out Akhenaten and Tutankhamen out of the list of the kings. So that is why they are they are looked down upon. Nothing got so. They are left out because of their their, their, their their position. These are God figures you're dealing with. Tutankhamen and Akhenaten, you're dealing with God figures. And that is why the necklace, that is why the necklace again, Another documentary that we have done on the YouTube. That is why the necklace again and on the shock of the hour. Of Tutankhamun, the necklace in the fifth room. It has 77 beads, but two of the beads are broken. Two of the beads are broken. And when you put these two broken beads together, you get 76 beads. Because they perfectly fit. And these two broken beads, 77, 76 represents the two missing name in the 76 the two missing name broken beads the two missing name in the 76 list of kings for the great king seti because it represents the two special beads 
the Akin Athena, the Tutankhamun, the first Christ, and the feathered snake, the living image of the sun, that was his name, the living image of Amun, Amun Ra. So this is higher than the Egyptologists, brother. This is higher than Budgeon and higher than Artin and Davis. This is higher than Carnival, man. Not Carnival, you no know, Carnival. Carnival. <laughs> well, you see, this is higher than bacon and eggs, Rasta. This is some different science that it needs those of us that were sent to uncrack the code straight to do it. So I'm saying all of that to say that Tutankhamun is a God figure. Not no just comedic king, you know. An international God figure. Line up with Buddha, Christ, anybody. A God figure. A feathered snake of the highest accord. Seen in the, all the halls of the mystics and the esoteric. Tutank Aten, the Tutank Aman. So when you see, when you see that, that, uh, that fall that the king wear, the comedic king, usually you just think about Tutank Aman right away. When you see that headdress, you think about Tutankhamun, right? Because, you know, he's the most famous of the kings. He made that famous. He's illustrious. He has the most gold and everything around him. And again, he's seen with the snake and the bird, which is outstanding. It is not the same with the other comedic kings. That he's unique. And for those, listen to me good. For those that don't understand the science, again, when you observe the throne of Tutankhamun, remember Tutankhamun's throne. I want to make this clear. Tutankhamun's throne was established for him, obviously, after Akhenaten came off, off of the scene. So when Akhenaten came off of the scene, he took the name Tutankhamun. So he was no longer Tutankhaten. Am I clear? Is that correct? Someone tell me. Okay. Now the throne has on the name of Tutankhamun and Tutankhaten. That's the throne of Tutankhamun. So, so somehow he's still, he's still connected to his past. You know what I mean? He hasn't totally cut the cords of the past. Because he has the name Tutankhaten still on his throne. And you know the Egyptologists, this is why we don't big up Tutankhamun, because the Egyptologists teaches us maybe because he was just a little boy. It was this man and that man, it was it was Maya and, and Ai and and um was there a man him and Reb, but one of these fellas here, it was them people here that was really the power behind the throne. Tutankhamun was just a little boy and they were ruling the throne in his name and he had to do what they had to say and whatever they told him he did. And they broke up all the statues that Akhenaten had of Aten and they mashed up Akhenaten's city and the, the, the carvings, not statues, but the carvings of him and his family and X, Y, Z. This is what we are taught and we are supposed to just believe that, as they say, take it hook, line and sinker. You know, the hook may be right, but what about the line and sinker? <laughs> you understand. The point I'm making is, on Tutankhamun's throne, he not only has both names. Look at the sun above him. That's Tutankhamun. You know? That's not Tutankhaten. That's Tutankhamun. This was found in his tomb. His tomb. This was put in his tomb after he died. He didn't even have a say on this now. So even if they didn't like what he had a say on, they didn't have to put this in his tomb. That is not Ra above Tutank Amun. That is Aten. That is Akhenaten's God. What is Akhenaten's God? 
doing and to anchor man's throw. After not only after Akhenaten has disappeared, years, at least ten years after Akhenaten disappeared. Because when Tutankhamun died at 19 or 20, according to some, all of these things that were placed in his tomb, I mean, I mean, look, there is Akhenaten's God. What is Akhenaten's God, who we hate so much? What is his God, his sole and only God? What is it doing on the throne? Of Tutanka man touching Tutanka man and his wife with them long stringy arms that Akhenaten created. Hmm? That's a ten. So it doesn't fit with the hatred that supposedly we had for Akhenaten after he ran away or whatever they say he did. That we mash down this and mash down that and, and Tutankhamun changed his name to Tutankhamun from Akhenaten from Tutankhaten to Tutankhamun and we move him back to Thebes and we break down that city and we mash up his name and we take out the carvings and we place back all the ancient gods and the Anubis and the Anu and everything that we had we put it back in order yeah but yet still on the throne of Tutankhamun, we still have the god Aten touching Tutankhamun like how it used to touch Akhenaten and both his name Tutankhamun and the Akhenaten or Tutankhaten is on his throne. Come on, think for yourself. Think for yourself. And the pyramid of Giza is older than the so-called oldest pyramids that they teach us, teach us about. Think for yourself. Yeah. For you to be seen in the clothes, that's what I call it, the clothes, the clothes, the apparel, the garments, for you to be seen in the garments of Tutankhamun with the snake and the bird on your head, you have to be somebody very special. For you to be seen in the clothes of Tutankhamun with the bird and the snake. That's the cycle of the sun. That's the cycle of the sun. That's the feathered snake. It's Tutankhamun alone that is the feathered snake. Not even Akhenaten. Not even Akhenaten is seen with the feathered snake. Tutankhamun is the feathered snake. The cycle of the sun. Linking him up with the Lord Pakal. The ultimate man. Linking him up with the Guatama. Linking him up with the link up. Linking him up with the king of kings. Linking him up with Negus and Nagas. The when they discovered the tomb. The God went and visited it. You know, man. A lot of things history don't tell us. Certain things and artifacts, they couldn't move until the king come, you know. A lot of things history has not told us. But we will get to that. Because we have a lot of programs we have to do on the diplomacy of the emperor. To prove to you that he was God Almighty in the political world. And I'm speaking directly of even, as I said... When we talk about directly the whole aspect of even the Knights of the Garter ceremony, we went beyond that when we showed you the depths of what is considered the, the, the wise Haile Selassie I, a Mason, and all of that. <laughs> On the governmental level. But Tutankhamun directly linked with Haile Selassie, it is factual. 
And we all outlined this in uh, the documentary seven, for sure. When we made the connection with the footstool of Tutankhamun and the mask of Lord Prakal, and we show that there is an ancient man, an ancient man directly aligned with the prophecy that Tutankhamun, the young boy figure, was replaced by this ancient man in the mask of Lord Prakal. Because remember, Lord Prakal himself, Lord Prakal represents the feathered snake of even that aspect. Lord Pakal represents the Quetzalcoatl even of that world. And Lord Pakal in his mask, that jade mask is very outstanding, eh? extremely outstanding as it relates to the future coming of the Almec, as we show the connection in the night of the black tiger to be that of Marcus Messiah Garvey. It is undeniable. I mean, I can't do the night of the black tiger now, but the Knights of the Black Tiger is there. You watch it, I don't think you can even, I mean, no one can stand up and say nothing. It's Marcus Garvey that represents the Olmec of that time, this time and the time to come. The link directly with Idi Amin and Marcus Messiah Garvey is directly linked to, 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 to Haile Selassie I and how we, how we made that link, not just through modern history, but with the mystic world. So, so even the three in the mask, the, the Lord Pakal and the Tutankhamun and the Gautama Buddha in the mask of Lord Pakal have seen in this time to be to be Marcus Garvey, Haile Selassie and the Honorable King Emmanuel Charles Edwards. And we have, we have taken our time to, I would say, prove this in the documentary against Seven, the divinity of the Honorable King Emmanuel Charles Edwards as well as the the um the the master of ceremonies himself um the the knight of the black tiger itself specifically as the knight of the black tiger directly um shows the the link between marcus messiah garvey and the olmec in that full aspect thereof so i'm just showing you that without a doubt Haile Selassie I is directly connected with the Tutankhamun figure. Haile Selassie I is the Tutankhamun in such a time. And that alone brings another aspect, another flavor to this reasoning and this discovery here, wherein Tutankhamun again has a specific look. And I'm saying that the snake and the bird that is seen in the portrayal of Tutankhamun is extremely important. Now for another person to be seen inside the casket, the tomb, the coffin, the portrayal of another one, casket number two, the face of another human being, Again, wearing the clothes of Tutankhamun, that is an extremely serious statement that is being made. For Semenka Ray to be seen in the clothes of Tutankhamun is an extremely important statement. Now I'm saying this, that Semenkare obviously in his own tomb was not seen to be worth anything he was not 
that important that we should have even left his name. So much so that he was on the floor and the coffin was broken up, the shrine was destroyed the names of the others that were associated with him was left intact. But his name directly was totally taken away. And we already noticed that this was a king. This was a ruler. This was an, a monarch. But yet still it was treated as if he was nothing. All that was supposed to be given to him as a royal monarch, as a king, was taken away. The chariots and the, 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 the weaponry and the beds of gold and the jars and the food and all the other things that would accompany you into the afterlife and even the, the remembrance of life and family life and your growing up and even the, the period that you ruled, all of this would be seen on the walls and there was nothing for him. It's just not important. His face was ripped off. You couldn't see a picture of who was behind the mask. And the name etched out of the canopy jars. There was no nothing. It took us to go through the forensic and to go through to through science and higher technology to figure out that this is Semenkare. This is he who ruled after Akhenaten. This is he who ruled just before Tutankhamun, almost like in the interim. And, 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 you know, coming in between intermediary kind of personality that we have here. So much so that history doesn't even really speak about him at all. But he's on the record. He's on the record. And obviously he seems to be seriously forgotten, often forgotten, despised to some degree, at least so it appears. But. inside of the tomb of Tutankhamun, a tomb wherein if you walk out of Semenkare's dark and dreary tomb and walk 13 meters, you walk into the illustrious tomb of who could be considered his twin. For their age was basically the same when they passed on although one was a few years prior to the other. And then at the same time, again, the total opposite was when it relates to the tomb, total opposite, full of life, joy, gold, and other precious metals and things. The tomb of Tutankhamun. But to your surprise, when you open Casket number three, which has a picture or the face of Tutankhamun in his most elder stage. You see casket number two that has the face of Semenkare, the fella from the dreary tomb. And when you open his casket, you see another face with Tutankhamun in a young boy face, look what somewhat figure of the nine year old. And then when you open that casket, you see the body, the goodie of Tutankhamun wrapped in gold with the gold mask on his head. And the mask looks just like the face in casket one and the face in casket three. But it doesn't look like the face that is seen on casket two because the face on casket two is the face of Semenkare. But he is ordained or, or, or adorned, pardon me, yet ordained in the apparel of the king Tutankhamun, down to what is unique 
to Tutankhamun, the snake and the bird. Semenkare was brought up to the level. Semenkare the nobody. Semenkare the nobody. Throw him on the ground, Semenkare. Scratch out his name, Semenkare. Put a double seal on his tomb so he really can't escape Samenkare. Rip off his face so his identity cannot be seen. That's Samenkare there. He was brought up like, like the, the Papa beggar Lazarus into Abraham's bosom. He was brought up to the point where he was seen in history now as the feathered snake literally in between the caskets in between the energy of he who came after him which is Tutankhamun Samenkare is a serious figure and if Haile Selassie is Tutankhamun So who could be Samenkare in them time? And one of the outstanding characteristics of Samenkare is that he is wearing the clothes of Tutankhamun. He is, he is carrying the identity of Tutankhamun. I mean, you see statues of Tutankhamun, he's not always dressed like this. He doesn't always have on the snake and the bird. Sometimes he only has on the snake, depending on how he's dressed. Sometimes he has on nothing, he just has on a little thing and, you know. You know. But he has a royal expression. And his royal expression is seen in the way that he has been buried. And there's another individual that is seen in his clothes, seen in his identity. And that other individual is Samenkare, he who is often forgotten. Now I am saying that Tutankhamun Haile Selassie the first, his imperial majesty, many ones of Rastafari, believe that Haile Selassie is not only still alive, many one also believe that they will see him again and when they see him, he will have locks and he will have beard and he will be moving like a Rasta man, like the Batawi at least. This is the belief of many to the point that ones have even highlighted a monk in Ethiopia that is seen in um, some of the pictures to be Haile Selassie and you see him with his matted hair and everything so there's this conscious or unconscious understanding or inner standing overstanding that Haile Selassie is much more than meets the eye for the army suit and the the you know the tailor-made suit that we see the emperor wear is still in contrast to even what he was coronated in but how humble is our emperor have you ever noticed that after the coronation of the emperor he never really wore that crown and all of that again you know? no even at the coronation anniversaries the emperor is always clad basically on a simple level never wearing the crown and having on all of that big robe and all of that, no. Army uniform, he would be at the coronation anniversary in his army suit. You know, he has obviously his diplomatic army suit and different levels to it and his, as I said, table made, ta tailor made three piece suit and all of these different things. That's the emperor, you understand? So there's that different level of identity, but there's an ancient tradition that the emperor hold fast to. There's an ancient tradition that the emperor holds fast to. And this is why as Rastafari, 
we see that Rastafari is that ancient tradition. And as a Bobo Shanti, I am saying that the order that King Emmanuel has brought to us is the tradition of the black man. That priestly order is the order of the black man. That empress order is the order of the black woman. And although it's not just the clothes, you know, but we must admit Baba Shanti is known for a specific type of attire, being the robe and the turban as, as man, and the fall and the long skirt, etc., as the woman. But the, the, the robe and the turban stands out as the Baba Shanti man, the, the garments of Prince Emmanuel Charles Edward the full cover and everything i'm saying outside of just the garments you know it's not really just the garments it's the liberty the garments is symbolic of the liberty the garments is symbolic of the lifestyle the sabbath so that is why we hold the honorable king emmanuel in that level of esteem as the melchizedek figure you know prophetically and, and just realistically that has brought forward a, a specific tradition, an ancient culture, an ancient African way, you know, that has been somewhat lost to us for a long time. This ancient tradition of the Bobo Shanti order, this, this ancient tradition of the Melchizedek order, you know, the hymn book and the Bible way, the, the sabbatical way, the feasting and fasting way, you know, and of course, the, it comes with the clothes as well. I am saying that Haile Selassie I, we have explained certain things, especially like in the documentary we did on YouTube when we answered the question, why doesn't, why doesn't Haile Selassie have locks? And of course, we highlighted some scriptures that clearly show that the Lord shall shave with the razor, the head, and the beard. And consume the beard with the razor hired from beyond the river of Assyria. And um, we took time to go into the depths of that. That is available on the internet. I won't really try to break that fully down now. But it's in clear language. And it's beyond the clear language, you know. As I said before, the, the whole science of the emperor himself. He came in a specific office to fulfill a specific work for a specific time. So even the elders of Ethiopia would grumble and mumble and some of them would fight when the emperor brought certain level of modernity to Ethiopia, modernizing Ethiopia, giving the soldiers boots to wear to go to battle, even that flipped some of the elders. No, no, like, come on, man, we never wear shoes. But um, this was a different time. And it's not a shoes thing, really. There's nothing wrong with shoes at all. But the point I'm making is that... Um, there are certain levels of this advancement that definitely is not really fully African. The, His Imperial Majesty himself said that we are introducing the, the uniform for our army. It is of the, the European fashion. I've read that, the European fashion. And I mean, you know, but I'm just saying all of that is symbolic also of shaving with that razor from the city of the heathen. That's what Assyria is, the city of the heathen, you know. It is very symbolic, very deep. And I said we, we took at least an hour plus to break that subject area down. That is in the archives. You can go on the YouTube and see that documentary, Why Doesn't Haile Selassie Have Locks? It gives you a great understanding of, you know, because a lot of these subject areas, it's not just to answer a question. It's the great understanding that goes with it you know so i'm saying all of that to say this is why now even as bobo shanti we see prince emmanuel as the individual not that that not bring his own thing you know and he doing his own thing and he make up his own thing no the order of king emmanuel is the divine order of Haile selassie that's how we see it. I mean, that's how we have to see it. How else do you think we would see it? Like, it's his own thing. That divine order of King Haile Selassie I, not the army clothes, not the feathered hat, you know, you know what I mean? And 
not the three piece suit. You know what I mean? No disrespect, but not even the Orthodox Church. You know what I mean? And, and, and you know, remember the emperors on a different level altogether, no man. All them banquets with the heads of states and roast duck on the table. And, you know, I mean, it's a different thing. He's the king. That is why we recognize the priest. That is why we, 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 we recognize him that brought us that ceremonial order in this unique unique dynamic time that we're living in in history as the elements of the three came together the king and the priest and the prophet straight up and the king himself as i said showing you his domain the knights of the god the ceremony his do domain entering and coming out of windsor the first to put on his hat his domain but yet still now that priesthood order that's why one Melchizedek came to the West and met the other Melchizedek that was living in the hills for seven years, according to the mysteries of Melchizedek, you know. So there we have now the Honorable King Emmanuel as that Melchizedek figure, again, expressing the true order of Haile Selassie I. Expressing the true order of the original man. And that is why we would speak of the visitation of 1966 and 1970 and the connection diplomatically and the UN and the OAU to show that direct link, you know, with the Ethiopian Empire and monarchy and the EABIC that Congress established by, again, the Honorable King Emmanuel Charles Edwards. And all of that link is not by mistake. So from our outlook, Basically, it's not really for everyone if they do not believe. It's just up to you. But from our outlook, the order that King Emmanuel Charles Edwards brought to us is the order of Emperor Haile Selassie I. So if you're looking to see Haile Selassie I again, you will see him in his order of choice, which I am saying to you would be the order of the Sabbath keepers, dressed in white in robe and turban the order of King Emmanuel Charles Edwards. This is my humble outlook on philosophy and theology. You understand? That's why we see King Emmanuel as the Christ. So in other words, King Emmanuel is wearing the clothes of the emperor. That is the emperor's order that he is teaching to us. He is teaching us how to be priests and kings unto the almighty God. All right. So this is why now Tutank Aman, in his tomb, there is another figure in the tomb that is worthy enough to be seen in the apparel of the king Tutankhamun, and this other individual that obviously is worthy enough, Samenkare. He who is brought up to the throne of Re, he is ennobled by Re, by Ra, by the Almighty Eye. This individual, this Semenkari, is seen in the clothes of Tutankhamun. He's seen as a feathered snake, but just 13 meters across the street, he's on the floor. He's beaten down. His mask is ripped off. We don't even want you to know about him. They etched out his name. Nobody for talk about this one here. Put a double, a double barrier on his tomb so he can't escape. Leave everybody else's name so we can confuse them and let them think it's he that did this and she that did this and they that did that. Yeah. He is despised, rejected, spat upon. His own received him not. They refused him. But the Almighty himself, the feathered snake himself, said, no, he's my chosen. He's the one that I elected. Line them up, 31 Rastafari. Can this represent Rastafari on a whole twin? Line them up, 31 Rastafari. This is Tutankhamun speaking. Them is my people. They look like me. Line them up. Let me give them 31 
gold medals. That's Semenka Ray. 31 Semenka Ray's line up in a man. To, to receive the gold medals from Haile Selassie I in 1966, the 21st day of April. Because, because we were seen in his image but not really in his likeness but we were seen in his image but he that was seen in his image and his likeness was the first was the first to receive his gold medal that's the honorable king Emmanuel Charles Edwards it is he that has the order to teach us the way of the spiritual aspect of Haile Selassie the first it is he directly, specifically fulfilling the prophecy of he that is often forgotten amongst his own, even amongst the authorities, but held in high esteem by the highest himself, King Emmanuel Charles Edwards is Samenkare. I am positive. Holy Emmanuel I. Selassie I ja Rastafari. So we give thanks for such word sound and we give thanks for such overstanding because as we do it's like mathematics. If Haile Selassie the first is to thank a man, which I think we have proven in other documents, even today I think we prove that. But even in other documentaries, we've definitely proved that if Haile Selassie is to anchor man, well, they've got to be somebody in that time or this time that fits the description of Samenkare. He is too important and he is too strategically and mysteriously and if you want to use the term because it's a part of the language masonically placed in in that strategic way to wear the clothes of the feathered snake that we're going to just overlook him as if we don't want to see who he is so we definitely give thanks for the life giver and the keeper of life in all good doings and all good sayings an individual that is beaten down, that is left, that is turned aside, but yet still just 13 meters, one, three away, therein you can find the difference, the contrast in that of Tutankhamun. And really, let me say as I take a sip of water past to be my, my chief of security, Rastafari, give thanks, my Lord. Let me do say that I am of the opinion that Samenka Ray's tool was purposely left like that. Not because of hatred, but to express this expression that I am expressing today. Tele El Marna and Amarna and Akhenaten's name being etched out and so unless it was done by the Greeks and the Romans and yes of course there were factions of disagreements amongst us and even during the time of the war against the Nubians and all of that and, and, and we are the Nubians really it's not no them and us it's one thing but overall don't get caught up in the Egyptologist's version of the story. We had a very sacred science that many cannot understand. A very sacred science. That is why I'm showing you two of the beads were broken. But when you put them together, you get one bead. The two names that were missing in the, the 76 names represents the 76 beads when you put the two beads together. But the Egyptologists will tell you, oh, they left out Tutankhamun's name and Akhenaten's name because they hated them. What do they know? We never practice no hatred. That's their stuff. You understand? So although Semenkare is too may seem so, 
I think it was was put in that way, maybe to dis, to mislead the same two robbers that we knew were coming, number one, but at the same time to show a level of expression in the science. He who is often forgotten, this person is going to be a person that you wouldn't even really take the time to look into him. Even amongst his own, sometimes they act as if he didn't exist. Even amongst his own, those who are even younger than him in a man, he's an elder to them, but sometimes they pretend he wasn't even around. But yet still he's put in the highest esteem by, by Tutankhamun himself, seen in the clothes of Tutankhamun, Samenkare. Yeah, man, give thanks to the black Christ in the flesh. I'm very thankful for your patient listening and attention. And we give thanks to the Lord of the Sabbath. We give thanks for the order that Prince Emmanuel has given us. I sincerely say that the black Christ has blessed us with uh, the original order. Give thanks to all those who have partook of this video lecture. All praises and honor to the black I am. Holy Manuel I, Selassie I, Jah, Rastafari, Blessed Lord.